Hello and welcome to worship today at Abiding Presence Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Miles Hopgood and it is a delight to be with you today as we gather to worship God together and to hear from Jesus the parable of the talents, chewing on the difficult teaching that to those who have, more will be given, and to those who have nothing, more will be taken away. Let us take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning. And as you are able, please rise in body or spirit for the order of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue worship by singing our gathering hymn. Christ, 
the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Righteous God, our merciful master, you own the earth and all its peoples, and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom, and prepare us for the joy of the day of your coming. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading is from Siphania, chapter 1, verses 7 and 12 through 18. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guest. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth should be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. And though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of darkness and gloom a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his passion, the whole earth shall be consumed for a full, a terrible end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for today is Psalm number 90, which we will read responsively by the whole verse. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. You turn us back to the dust and say, turn back, O children of earth.
You sweep them away like a dream. They fade away suddenly like the grass. For we are consumed by your anger. We are afraid because of your wrath. When you are angry, all our days are gone. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. Who regards the power of your wrath? Who rightly fears your indignation? The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness, so then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Twenty-fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, For it, as, it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them, and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, 
Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. This is a moment for a special message for all of our younger members. So if that includes you, sit up extra straight, scooch a little further to the front of the couch, because what follows is especially for you. I have a question for you. Who here knows what the word inadequate means? Normally, I would be able to hear from you if you knew what it meant or didn't, so just in case it's a word that is new to you, I'll tell you about it. Inadequate means that what you have isn't enough or doesn't feel that way. And I bet each of you has felt like that from time to time. Like what you had wasn't enough. Maybe you felt like you weren't fast enough or nimble enough to join a team for a certain sport, that you didn't know enough, weren't good enough at math to be able to pass a test or to join an athletic bowl team or something like that. Maybe you felt like you weren't pretty or attractive enough to be able to be liked by somebody else, that you weren't good enough or kind enough or noticed enough to be loved by someone else. Feeling inadequate is one of the worst feelings I can ever think of, certainly for myself. Every time I've felt inadequate, that has felt terrible. This parable that Jesus tells us today is a reminder that to God, we are never not enough. We are always exactly who God made us to be. However you are, what you are able to do or not, how you feel you look or are seen by others, none of that matters to God. For God loves you exactly the way you are and has given you something more precious than anything else. God has given you God's love for you. Not any more or any less than anyone else. God has given you the same extremely large amount of love, an abundance, we say, of love. To get a little bit ahead to Thanksgiving, a cornucopia of love, overflowing. God sees you exactly for who you are, the way you are, and looks at you and says, you are amazing, beautifully, wonderfully made. There is nothing about you that God would change. So there is no need to do what this one slave did in the parable, to take that wonderful gift of yourself and hide it in a hole. To be afraid of failing at life, of coming up short, of not making the team, of not being seen and loved by others, there is no need to be afraid. For wherever you go, no matter what happens to you, you will always have God's love for you with you every day. There is no need to fear. And even when you are afraid, and it happens to all of us, you can remind yourself, trust in God's promise, that God's love for you is always there, overflowing, 
every day abundant for you. And you can share that good news with everyone else, for it's the same for them too. Everyone you meet, no matter who they are, no matter how unlovable curmudgeon they might seem, God loves them just as much as God loves you, which is to say, a whole lot. Take this good news with you as you go back to your seats and out into the world today. Thanks for joining me. Bye. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Whenever I hear this parable from Jesus today, I am always reminded about that time when as a fairly young child, I learned what happens when you multiply by zero. Now for our younger members who might not have reached that point in their math classes yet, any number, no matter what it is, small or big, it doesn't matter. Any number multiplied by zero always equals zero. Anything times nothing is always nothing. Now, unlike some folks who took that information and banked it away, I found this to be fascinating and hilarious. And I would often come up with the most insane math problems for people that always, somewhere along the line, resulted in multiplying by zero. What is 786 quadrillions 532,000 times some other crazy number, some other crazy number, times zero, those in the know would patiently sigh and respond that the answer was zero, and I would laugh uproariously. Now again, somewhere around third or fourth grade, the magic of this wore off. It is an elementary school math lesson. How is it then that this simple principle seems to have escaped Jesus today? For when he tells us that those who have nothing, even more will be taken away from them, seems to have missed the point that those who have nothing cannot have anything to take away by virtue of having nothing. Now, the pedants among us might point out the fact that the concept of zero that you and I have today was invented somewhere around the 5th century in India, and therefore, as a matter of fact, Jesus didn't know what it meant to multiply by zero. But that's not the point. Everyone who knows anything knows that what it means to have nothing is to not have anything, and therefore there would be nothing to take away. Or do we know that? For take a moment and think about it. I guarantee you can find in your mind, if only in fiction, if not in your own story, someone who had nothing and yet had something taken from them. Perhaps the experience in your own life or simply in some delightful romantic comedy of learning that someone you used to have a crush on who you thought was never going to like you back in fact did have the same crush on you. How flabbergasted you must have felt realizing that this person you had felt these feelings for would have reciprocated them if only you had had the gall to speak your feelings aloud. Or perhaps you can think of that feeling realizing the opportunity you had somewhere back in the 90s to invest in some giant tech conglomerate that is now worth billions and billions of dollars. If only I had bought into Apple, into Google back then, you think to yourself. Oh, what retirement I could be enjoying, enjoying right now in my 40s. Dig deep enough and we can find stories like this, stories where we all had nothing and yet somehow found new depths of what we could have lost. Not something we had, but something of the way things could have been. A future, a life we never imagined possible, but then somehow, retroactively, was taken away from us. That type of nothing always has more 
to lose. So we found some wisdom then, some poetry in these words of Jesus. But how do they connect to this parable we read about today? For at first glance, no one has nothing in this parable of Jesus. Even this third slave that we are clearly meant to take our lesson, our warning from, comes to his master upon his return with something in hand. He does not come empty, having lost everything that was entrusted to him. No, he comes with exactly what he has been given. Every ounce of that talent, that huge sum of money, accounted for. How then can we say that this slave had nothing if he comes with such richness to present to his master? This is the first of many indicators in this parable that what we are not talking about here, what Jesus is disinterested in, is money or economics. This is not a parable about finances. No, this is a parable about something more fundamental, more deep, more bedrock to our lives. This is a parable about faith. For that is precisely what this third slave lacks. Let's start this parable from the beginning and walk through so that we can see exactly how this is a parable about faith. Take, first of all, the first two slaves, the ones who are lauded by their master. When their master returns, having entrusted them with five and two talents respectively, and sees the return on that investment, what has been returned to him, doubling those monies, ten by the first, four by the second, handed back over. The master does not praise their financial acumen, their entrepreneurial or innovative spirits. There is nothing capitalistic or economic that he finds laudable in them. No, they are good and trustworthy, faithful to what has been given them. There is no greater reward for the one who had five or the one who had two. Both, with same wording, equal joy, are brought in to the joy of their master, enter into a new relationship with him, are slaves, servants no longer, but friends. And similarly, with this third slave, we find no moderation in the master, no sense that he had just made six times over, seven times in fact, no, yep, seven, what this servant had failed to bring to him. Those are acceptable losses, or rather lack of gain to any economist. No, what upsets the master here in this parable is not the lack of money that this slave brings, but the characterization of the master by which the slave justifies what he's done. I knew you were a harsh man, says the slave, who reaps where he did not plant and gathers where he did not sow. Oh, you knew, says the master, that I was like this, he said, and yet you did not even live in this way by giving this money to the bankers to invest. What has upset the master? What has brought around this reversal of fortune? What makes the money meaningless? As if this slave has no idea who the master is, though the evidence is all around him. For look again at this parable. Where is this harsh master that the slave knew? The master that we meet, the one Jesus tells us about, has been nothing but generous and in abundance, has left these slaves in charge of vast fortunes, talents, monies in sums beyond what they could ever have imagined to see or control, to have in their hands. This master 
has done this, and yet this slave does not see him for who he is, sees him for exactly who he is not. He does not have faith in this master, and therefore acts in accordance, not out of abundance, out of joy, out of freedom with which he has been given, but out of fear and self-preservation. This is always what a lack of faith looks like. It is for this reason that Martin Luther says that those who have faith have everything, while those who lack faith have nothing. For lacking a confidence in what was all around him, the evidence that surrounded him, the generosity of his master, he acted only in a way of self-preservation of attempting to protect himself from a wrath that was not there, to make secure something that the master had no concern about protecting, to take everything that was his, a richness beyond imagining, and to do nothing with it, to bury it in the sand, to treat it as something that could only by hiding protect himself, rather than something to live in a fresh and new way. This, too, is how faith works in our life, the difference that faith makes. For when we trust and believe that God is who God said God is, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, that Christ came not to judge and condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. When we know this about God, when we trust it, when we find our lives in those words, we live in a wholly new and different way, fearing nothing, hoping in everything, living with an abandon that the world cannot envision that the world might even find foolish, yet to us is nothing but joy and assurance that the treasure we have, the richness of this world, is ours by faith, and that we too enjoy it no matter what this world throws at us. So too, when we lack faith, when we do not think that God is who God says God is, when we imagine that we must do something, be something, in order for God to love us, to find our safety and security in this world. So then, does everything around us, whether it is big or small, minute or infinite, become nothing. We find it already for us buried in the sand, for when we lack this trust in God, there is nothing around us that is not bent to our own foolish self-preservation, attempting to protect ourselves, guard ourselves, steel ourselves against a world which is as harsh as the slave imagines his master is. A life lacking in faith finds no sum of money sufficient 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, a billion, it does not matter. Increase must come. More and more must be acquired to feel safe and secure. Yet like someone suffering from dropsy, the faithless person drinks and drinks and only finds themselves thirstier still. They are restless, finding no place to rest. For when faith is absent, there is no peace or security, only the simulacrum of it, and it takes only the slightest breeze to bring it crashing down. And yet, to one who has faith, who is assured by the word of God that where Christ is, there they shall also be. There is no gale, no typhoon, no blizzard, no earthquake which can shake their foundation no hardship which cannot be endured as challenging as it might be. For they know 
that there is no power in this world which can take away from them what they have through faith in Christ Jesus. A relationship, a rightness, a home with the creator of all that is seen and unseen. Whom then shall we fear? What trouble could sway us, says that heart so filled with faith. This is what this parable is meant to teach us, dear friends. That those who have faith have everything, and even more, all things in abundance. And that those who lack it, no matter what they have, have nothing, and yet somehow even more only to be taken from them. Not by God or anyone else, but by themselves. For think again on those examples I began with today. Who robbed us of that love that we only then learned was part of our past, that crush that was unrequited? Who can we blame but ourselves? Of that investment not made, of that life not lived. We have this anger of learning what could have been, look where we could direct it and find that there is no one to blame but ourselves. We are our own enemies in this way. So concerned with finding a way to save and preserve ourselves that we look past the one whose salvation is there freely given, who is for us security and safe harbor that nothing can ever overcome or assail. Such is the great power of faith. And before you begin down that quest of wondering, what must I do to acquire this? What must I do to earn such faith? Understand this before all else. Faith is the gift of God. It is worked in you, not by your own hands, mouth, or heart, but by the hands that were pierced on the cross for you. The heart that there poured itself out for love of you. The mouth who speaks to you words of good news that today, on the darkest of all days, you shall be with me in paradise. Faith is worked in us by the word of God, proclaimed to us even by the stones when there are no mouths to speak it. The word of God that declares, you are my beloved, and you I am well pleased. The word of God that cries out that even though we die, yet we shall live. The word of God that cries out, I did not lose a single one of those you gave me. For faith is nothing more than trust. And trust is never something we work in ourselves. We do not come to trust someone else because we try, we work at it. No, that person works their trust in us through their actions, through their words, through their consistency. And this is precisely what God does. We begin in creation. We trace the history of Israel, of the prophets, and of the church, and we find nothing else but the same story of God's persistent and faithful love, enduring all things, bearing all things for our sake. We see in that story, in that proclamation, the consistent love and persistent adherence to us of God. And in so hearing, faith finds its home in our hearts in a way that we could never bring it by our hands. All that is there to occupy us is the life we now get to live because what God has done for us. A life, too, we see modeled in this parable. Not of bearing the richness that is around us, what we have now by faith. For faith does not find itself at home in a hole in the ground, but out in the world, among all things that God has created. Creation that cries out for healing and wholeness. People who cry out for love and respect and roofs and clothes and homes and food and all good things that God has given us to share. That is where faith finds its home. Poured out richly among all people, coming back in an abundance we could never have imagined returns on investment, 
that would seem impossible, scandalous, nigh criminal to anyone with a knowledge of economics, yet to us trusting in the abundance of God, a bounty, a harvest that is reasonable and expected. This is the home of faith. Where we find it, there everything else will follow. For put faith in a hole and all of a sudden the entire world will be there. Find our faith where God pulls us through it, in the world around us, out of our hands and out among all people. And there will be a richness beyond imagining where none will hunger, none will chill or heat, none will be in want. All will find wholeness, richness, full bellies and glad hearts. It is for us, dear friends, to live this life, not fearful of judgment or anxious for ourselves, but happy and glad that God has so freed us and enriched us to live in this way, that even when we are in want, we are wealthy beyond measure. Even when we are crushed and pressed down, we are lifted up, secure always in the presence of our God. How each of us, individually but most of all together, will live this life is for us to discover together to dream and to imagine what it means to be stewards of this treasure of faith that God has given us. As you ask these questions today and this week, remember always that they are the questions of one who has been freed from anxiety and fear, freed from whatever is around us and pressing in on us. They are the questions of a people who have their home always and forever in a kingdom that is now and will forever be that of God, our Savior and Lord. Be at peace, freed people of God, and share this good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our worship today by rising in body or spirit to sing our hymn of the day.
confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Longing for Christ's reign to come amongst us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need. Lord of the church, ignite your people with the passion of your love. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, unify us across ministries, congregations, and denominations, and refine us to participate in your activity throughout the world. We pray for our bishops, Elizabeth and Tracy, for our mission partner, St. Bartholomew's, and for pastors, deacons, chaplains, and all the faithful. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord of creation, we stand in awe at the works of your hands and praise you for the beauty of nature, especially the Sourlands Mountain Preserve and the Delaware River. Bless the earth for your glory and restore its integrity for expectation, expectation has ruined. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord of the nations, sound forth your justice in the ears of all leaders. Increase concern for those who are most vulnerable, especially as international leaders forge trade agreements and cooperate to end human rights abuses. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of all in need, search out all who cry to you in distress. Scatter the heavy clouds of depression, chronic illness, unemployment, and loneliness with your radiant light. Send us as encouragement and signs of your healing. We pray especially for Barbara, Hannah Laura, Amanda, B, Nick, Edna, Trish, Mia, Sheila, Nancy, Martha, Matt, Wanda, Barbara, Jean, Joanna, Danuta, Jim, Edward, David, Wayne, Jack, Megan, Carol, Richard, Bill, and Amanda. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Lord of the stranger, stir up holy restlessness in us to extend love to those at the margins. Release our desire for control and open us to learn from the perspectives of others. Hear us, O oh Lord, your mercy is great. Lord of the living and the dead, we give you thanks for all the saints at rest from their labors, especially Helen Warwick. Rouse us to live by their example that saints yet to come may also know your love. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. 
Please share a sign of peace with one another in the chat box, in the comment section, in person, or simply through the Spirit. As we prepare our offerings today, we'll begin with a word from our acting chair of our stewardship committee, Tim Brill. Thank you for the opportunity to share a brief message on this year's stewardship emphasis using the theme, even in uncertain times, we trust in God's faithfulness to provide all we need and more. As we prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, we as a congregation are moving forward in faith, generously sharing our resources with our neighbors and preparing to sustain and grow our ministries in 2021. In the coming week, you will receive a letter with an estimate of giving card and information asking you to consider growing your level of giving in the new year as a percentage of your income. Please prayerfully consider a generous response to this request as a reflection of your trust in God, acknowledging that he will always be with us through our good times and our challenges. The mailing includes a percentage giving chart to help us estimate where we stand in our current level of giving as we strive to grow toward a tithe the biblical standard of 10% of our income. On a personal note, I'll share with you, uh, I have personally not always given uh, a high percentage of my income, but over the years, I have used these opportunities to grow in faith, uh, increasing my pledge over a period of time to the point now where I am uh, able to uh, make a more meaningful contribution, and I can only begin you to tell you how much that has changed my life and the ability I have to trust God to provide for all that I need. I hope you will take advantage of this opportunity uh, to grow in your faith, even in these uncertain times. In reality, there is really no better time to demonstrate our trust in God. Thank you very much. Let us pray. O oh God of justice and love, 
We give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, it has been a delight to worship with you today, and I hope that whenever or wherever you are joining us from, that you'd feel the presence of God's Spirit with you now. I have just a few announcements for the good of our life together. First, an explanation for those of you who attempted to join us for evening prayer last Wednesday and found that there was nothing there. I am happy to report that it was not my fault. The problem was with YouTube. YouTube went down that evening and we were unable to stream. We will be back again this Wednesday, though, uh, YouTube willing, for another session of evening prayer. That, though, will be our last live-streamed evening prayer for a while. The week following, we will have a special Thanksgiving Eve service online. And then beginning the next week in Advent, we will be returning with Holden evening prayer on Wednesday evenings. I look forward to seeing you at those services, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to join one more time for our live streamed evening prayer next Wednesday. Next Sunday is Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday of the liturgical year, and we will be worshiping together that Sunday with the entire Synod in a service led by our Synod staff. So uh, please come to YouTube in the same sort of way we have in the past for Synod worship. Links to that will be included in Share and Prayer on our Facebook page and places like that. But that is where you'll be able to find us next week. We'll be back to our usual place and time uh, the week following with Advent 1. Other than all of these changes to worship, things remain the same. We continue together at noon on Saturdays for outdoor prayer and fellowship and we continue together on Wednesdays and Thursdays for youth and adult education, respectively, at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesdays and 7 p.m. on Thursdays. If you have not joined us for any of those yet and you would like to, please be invited. You are always welcome. Links to the Zoom meetings that we use for those education hours can be found in Share and Prayer. And if you keep hearing me talk about this Share and Prayer thing and wonder, how do I get on such an amazing email list, we would be glad to do that for you. Simply email the office, aplcoffice at gmail.org. You can find that on our website, and we'll be glad to put you on that mailing list. If there are any other announcements, please put them in the chat box or the comment section. And if you want me to make an announcement, just make sure to get that to the office by Wednesday so I can include it in the announcement portion. As you are able, please rise in body or spirit to receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We continue worship by singing our sending hymn.
Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.